Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, judging by the uh, the attendance here, that everyone did get the clear communication that this was the location. Uh, apologies to any of there was a bit of confusion as to where we were hosting this uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Don Duval. Uh, I'm the CEO of NORCAD, and in conjunction with our partners at Light Corps and the Goodman School of Mines, uh, I am very excited this evening to introduce Ilsa Turnick, who will be speaking on women, leadership, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Now, judging by the number of people here this evening, uh, and especially the number of women here this evening, it's very encouraging and inspiring to know how many people care not only about this topic, um, but are also very interested to listen to one of Canada's eminent and uh, eminent business and community leaders. For those that are not aware, Ilsa is the CEO of the Mars Discovery District, one of the world's largest innovation centers in the heart of downtown Toronto. Prior to Mars, Ilsa served as the president and CEO of Prime Access, a startup venture capital tech fund focused on advanced technologies. And prior to that, she was an entrepreneur with senior manager roles in a number of emerging technology companies. <laughs> Ilsa is very active in Canada's innovation community. She is chair of the Canadian Task Force on Social Finance. She represents Canada on the GA Social Impact Investment Advisory Board and is, a, and is a member of the Government of Canada's Science, Technology and Innovation Council. She is the chair of the Board of Triphase, an innovative cancer drug development accelerator. She has been selected as one of Canada's most powerful women four times. She attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, attaining a PhD in chemistry. Originally from South Africa, she was recognized as one of Canada's top 25 immigrant leaders. And to boot, in 2013, she was inducted into the Women's Executive Network Hall of Fame. In addition to these achievements, she is also the mother of four wonderful children. But there is one overarching accomplishment that really stands out in Ilsa's career. One that I would deem should be celebrated more often, but frequently overlooked, in that she was my boss for what I'm sure could be the most exciting five years of her career. <laughs> Actually, more like probably the most exhausting years of her career. But in spite of that, she still made a trek up to Sudbury, and on behalf of our partners in doing this tonight, we're ecstatic to have her here. This evening, Ilsa will tell some life stories and really tell it like it is. The talk tonight talks very well with our community's commitment to ongoing leadership development with the upcoming leadership conference, as well as the Northern Leadership Program, both key initiatives to build capacity and competency of leadership in our community. From a format perspective, uh, Ilsa will take questions at the conclusion of her talk, and we'll have a floating microphone. So I would ask that if you have a question, raise your hand, and if appropriate, we'll build a queue, and we'll definitely get to you uh, to ask your question. So with that, I would like to introduce Ilsa Turner, tonight's guest speaker. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. What a wonderful, wonderful venue. And uh, Don, thank you very much for inviting me um, to speak here and to uh, Glencore and the Goodman School of Mines and Science North. Um, and all of you for giving up a very precious evening for this conversation. Thank you. I'm honored. Um, as, as Don said, he asked me to uh, make this personal to talk about my, my own story. And I think as it is the case for many women, I find that whole exercise just completely embarrassing. Um, it just feels totally inadequate, you know, as if the story should make more sense. Um, as if the story should uh, contain more action. Um, or at least, you know, at a minimum, be more entertaining. So, um, but I think we all recognize that our, you know, our travels, our journeys unfold through this sort of complicated mix of um, chance and choice and time and place. And, uh, uh, but I said yes, because I know that telling the stories is very important. Um, and too many women's stories actually remain untold. And that these stories, even unentertaining ones like mine, um, can sometimes be useful as, as just guideposts and, and um, navigation tools, for particularly for younger women. <clears throat> there is a side benefit to being asked to tell your story, is it really does make you think back on those forks in the road, you know, the, the choices made and the choices not made, um, a little bit of fate, um, a little bit of luck. 
and um, and uh, that suits you know all that stuff that's kind of at the heart of how am I? What am I? Why am I here? Um, and uh, does it matter? <laughs> The other thing is it also reminds you that you're not taking this journey alone. And of course there are people that travel with you that are close to you, but uh, you're also part of the global community. And let me just say, I stand here tonight as a Canadian woman feeling very, very fortunate in the global context. Um, and I never forget that. So, so thank you for your indulgence and thank you for giving me this task. Um, so, so to Don's point, let me start at the beginning. I was born and raised in South Africa, and, and early on I had an experience that I think in retrospect actually was quite formative uh, to where I am today. And that is that since I was very, very young, I absolutely loved to run. And my grandfather had a wonderful farm uh, in the sort of middle part of Africa, and there was nothing more magical about running in the African countryside as a kid. Um, there's free, it was empowering, it was all of those things. And so in my teens, this became my obsession. I just, that was all I wanted to do was run. And um, as a result, I became, you know, South Africa's um, national middle distance running champion and a pretty sports obsessed country. And my dream was to compete internationally, and particularly in the Olympics. But South Africa was banned from international sports competition at the time because of the apartheid regime. And so all I could do was attend some of those events as a spectator. Now, from inside South Africa, it was really clear that this pressure, um, the sports boycott, was, was very effective in terms of putting pressure on decision makers to uh, make political change. And I would certainly say you know, my own political consciousness was maturing at the time and I was sort of, I knew the change had to come and I was myself developing into a, a student activist. But here was this tension because my dream was to run in the Olympics and I couldn't because of this political system that I as a white person was benefiting from and morally opposed to. So that whole thing of the political as the personal, um, you know, became a, a very real um, issue at the time. And I still feel that very tangibly today. Uh, I also remember as a 15-year-old, you know, with Mandela in prison and Steve Biko beaten to death and blood in the streets, thinking, God, if there were some women involved in all of this, I'm not sure this would have unfolded the way it had. So politics needs women and women needs politics to reflect what they want. So after that, although I had many interests, um, science won out and I did undergraduate degree in, in chemistry and math while remaining very active in, in the anti-apartheid movement. But post the 76 riots and the violence that came after that um, and living for some time under security surveillance, I decided it was probably a good idea to get out of the country for a while. So I applied for a bunch of scholarships because that was the only way I could afford to get out. And as you heard from Don, I completely lucked out and won a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford. I arrived at Balliol College, 1979, as one of the first nine women admitted to Balliol. Now last year, I went to Balliol College's 750th birthday party. So it took them a while to let women in. Um, but Oxford was a completely magical place. I mean, I met amazing women, people from all over the world. I learned about all kinds of stuff, being able to take a step back from that sort of consuming issue of the racial politics of South Africa. And, you know, I fell in love with chemistry all over again, uh, being able to, uh, to work with some of the best people in the world. And while I was at Oxford, I met a Canadian from Woodstock, Ontario. And after some negotiation, I agreed that I would come and do a postdoc at Western University um, to, you know, see if I could survive the winter. <laughs> and it was one of those unexpected detours of life. I'd always planned to go back to South Africa, but here I am today. And I've now spent more years in Canada than I spent in South Africa, which I think, you know, for newcomers is always a sort of a threshold that you pass. 
Um, and like most newcomers, I am absolutely fiercely Canadian. I count myself as an incredibly lucky person that I'm able to live and work in this incredible country and that I've been able to raise my four kids here. And yes, I did marry the boy from Woodstock. <clears throat> so during my, my postdoctoral fellowship, I decided that my love was really more about putting science to work to solve problems than, rather than the, the fundamental discovery process. So, you know, with a respectable chemistry degree, I did the right thing and applied to respectable chemistry companies and got, you know, some opportunities, but just didn't feel right. And, you know, this is where, you, when you look back, you're like, wow, what happened, would have happened if I chose the other fork in that road? Um, but rather than take one of those respectable jobs, I joined the crazy startup um, in green chemistry out of the University of Toronto. We had five employees and the company went public the next year. So I learned everything about business in a complete crash course. The only problem was I joined the company three months pregnant. So it really wasn't good timing. But having spent so many years in university, you know, being now in the pressure cooker of, of that startup uh, environment, um, and I remember also at the same time buying my first, ha uh, first house, thinking, oh my God, how does one ever owe that much money? It just seemed impossible. Do you remember that feeling? It's like, how could one possibly ever pay off this much money? Anyway, but I always loved kids and I wanted to have kids, so, so there you go. And so the way this small company that was you know, on a massive growth trajectory dealt with the fact that I was pregnant and clearly going to have a baby sometime soon, is they gave me a big promotion the week before the baby was due, making it pretty much impossible to take any time off. And so my firstborn came to work with me for several months. Now that was just really stupid. <laughs> um, I stayed with the company until I had my second child and then that funny thing happened with in a dual career family where you know my husband's circumstances became um, involved a lot more travel and the company was crazy and I realized you know what I can't actually be the kind of parent I want to be with this kind of circumstances. And so I took a change and uh, started to do some consulting work um, just to get a bit more control over my time. And it was a good way to stay connected and I was very lucky, frankly. I had great clients, multinational firms, startups, um, some industry associations and so on. So it was a great way to stay connected. But uh, certainly when the youngest was three, I was sort of ready to get back into a, a bigger team and paint on a bigger canvas. So during my consulting work, I continued to work with startups, and particularly in product development and helping them raise capital, which of course is always the big challenge for young companies. And so not long after um, getting back into things in the full swing of things, I was approached by the Royal Bank to start this seed stage venture capital fund. And I always think of it that I really became a venture capitalist accidentally. I was totally an accidental venture capitalist. But we built a great portfolio of sort of engineering type companies, you know, through the boom and out the other end of the, in the bus, and we were uh, very hands-on seed stage investors, so very interesting uh, period. But just one side comment. Uh, I certainly worked in science and lots of areas of technology. Um, I've never worked in an environment that was as hostile to women as the venture capital sector. Like nothing I had ever seen. And that, of course, has huge implications for women founders that are trying to build businesses. And I'm sad to say it hasn't changed one bit. So during the, the, my tenure at Primaxis, um, the idea of Mars uh, was, was started. And I was involved as a community member um, you know, through the early stages and so on. But I joined Mars in the beginning of 2005 for a really simple reason. John Evans asked me, and I don't know how many of you know John Evans, but he was sort of the visionary finder, founder behind Mars, and certainly he's the greatest Canadian I know. And he was by then in his late 70s, he was working like a dog as a volunteer to get this project off the ground, and I thought, well, the least I can do is try to help him. My friend all thought I was nuts, and it was, it was a pretty crazy project. Um, but for me, the fact that John asked was enough. So, and so for the last nine years, I feel like I've gone right back into that startup 
um, you know, life and certainly a complex uh, um, startup. And now Mars is through that startup phase and despite what you might have read in the paper, is poised for its next very exciting phase of growth. Uh, but bringing it back to the personal, the fortunate thing for me is Mars sits right at that intersection of you know, science, technology, and social innovation, finance, business, public policy, entrepreneurship, um, all the threads that I'm interested in is grappling with a very tough problem, is what do we have to do today so that we can be competitive 10 years from now? Um, how do we, as a modest-sized country, um, build competitive capacity by maybe collaborating more? Um, and what, what is Canada's role in a, in a fast-moving global innovation system? So, there's lots of lessons from Mars, but my time there has reinforced, with the exception of Don, how important it is to work with, with really great people. Um, <laughs> people you love and respect. Um, and, and work on something that's not just intellectually challenging, but that has a larger purpose. Uh, because what happens is that purpose will attract people um, of amazing talent, and it'll create a kind of energy in the workplace that's very difficult to replicate. And certainly I feel very fortunate that I've been, been able to be part of this kind of a, a project that's building capacity for the future, and certainly the, the benefits will be uh, will only be seen you know, decades after I'm gone. Something that John Evans like, totally understood. So that's kind of the backdrop. So I thought, let me give you sort of 10 observations from this, this you know, wacky journey. And some of them sort of came into focus upon reflection, I have to say. So the first one is, I think, a reassuring one. And that is, you know, life is both short, but if you're blessed with good health, it's longer than you think. And so you can put it another way, life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And, you know, we all sometimes feel we're in the sprint, and there's certainly periods you've got to sprint. Uh, but you also have to pace yourself. And... Um, and you will, uh, you've will you got to guard your energy and, and save it for the important stuff. And that also means avoiding workplaces and people that, that take too much energy. And it's funny, at this point, I'm absolutely intensely aware of the fact that my most important non-renewable resource is my time. And I've now finally learned how to say no. I was really bad at that for a long time. Now, the second observation is, I think like many women in my generation who entered the workplace in the 80s, um, you know, I was totally naive. I thought you could just kind of plow ahead, have kids, have a career, have it all. Um, and then somewhere in the 90s, they upped the ante and said, you know, you've got to be super everything, and you've got to do all of this in some, you know, meditative state of balance. Um, I've sort of developed a more pragmatic view of all of that. I think balance has a long wave function. You know, for, uh, for certain periods of time, um, some things will be more in focus and other things will be more out of focus. It's a long wave single. And you, you can certainly combine the rich experiences of a professional life and a personal life and community engagement um, over that long period, but if you look at any point in time, something's probably totally out of whack. And that's true for every woman I know, even the ones that pretend to have the balance thing nailed. Um, so, you know, I think the, over a, a, a lifetime, that version of balance, I think, or at least a taste of, of that version of balance can, can be had. But, some things that might seem really important may just not be possible right now. And I think the trick is to try and not lose sight of them. Um, because time demands will shift and they may come back maybe in a slightly different form later. So when you string these periods of wackiness together, I think over time, um, if you're pragmatic, you can have a decent sort of view if you have good health. And of course that's always the big if. Now, for me, the balance shifted roughly every decade. You know, my 20s, I got educated and traveled. Um, in my 30s, I had kids and launched them. In my 40s, I kind of got back into refocusing on my career. And now I'm building something for the long haul. So I think of these almost as chapters in a book. And, you know, each chapter uh, stands alone. 
um, but is connected to the next one and is informed by what happened in the past and new learnings and so on that emerge. Uh, but each chapter also on, the, on its own is a bit incomplete and a bit unsatisfying. Uh, but if you stitch them together, you sort of get a reasonably coherent narrative. Which brings you, might me to the third point, and that is that the thread that runs through your book is you. It's your life, it's not somebody else's life. And it's not a dress rehearsal for something that might happen in the future. So you better get on it, um, because figuring out what's important to you, um, what your values are, and what you're good at and not so good at is really important because once you're over 80, no, 18, nobody's going to care more about how your book's written than you. And like any character in a book, of course it will be shaped by the people that surround you and the, to the people you choose to, to surround you and you'll learn new things. Um, but ultimately it's your book. And the important part of that is it's really important to kind of check in and recalibrate with that or you, uh, and make time for reflection. Because modern life is in such a hurry. And I've come to the conclusion as I get older that busyness is the biggest seductive trap. It's very hard to have a remarkable life when you're just darting from one task to the next. It's really difficult. And I wish I'd learned that, that earlier. It's also true that who you really are does come in focus, I think, over time. And it was only, it took me a while to figure out, for me, there's sort of three core pieces. The first, I'm definitely an entrepreneur. I started my first company when I was 14. I've always been a kind of a catalyst and a, and a builder of things. The ambiguity and the messiness of the startup phase doesn't, you know, it's fine. I, I love it. Um, it's the rigid structures and the fixed opinions that scare me to death. So that's who I am. The second piece is I'm a very classic, and I suspect there are many of you in this room that fit this profile. I am a classic T-shaped person. I have a very strong trunk of core expertise acquired through education and immersion you know, in, in specialized work. But I've spent most of my working life in the treetops, right? Making the connecting um, links to, to adjacent pieces, sometimes dangling off the edge of of a branch. Um, but the trunk is my frame of reference. It's my tool toolkit. It's my analytical framework. It grounds me, it nourishes me, it anchors me. Sometimes it really constrains me um, because it's so fixed. Um, but that's my shape. I'm not a generalist. And I always come back to, to that, uh, that core. And people have different shapes. And in fact, I need people of other shapes around me to both be successful and happy. And then the third observation, which was very important, was that for me at least, the personal and the professional and the societal have to be in sync. And there was a lot of tension when those three, for the periods that those three were, were um, uncoupled or where one took priority over the other. And I certainly function best when I'm working on something that I'm pretty good at, that I care about, and that also has some sort of broader purpose. And maybe that's why I took a less traditional path is so that I could carve out the, that blend. The fourth observation I would make is that having children made me much better at my work. Because I learned not to sweat the small stuff. Especially the stuff that drains energy. Kids take a huge amount of emotional energy. They also teach you not to take yourself too seriously. Because frankly, when you come home, they really do not care that you had a bad day. They have absolutely no interest. So it also was helpful just to get out of my head. So I think any of us that do, you know, that either are scientifically or technology-wise trained, you know, we tend to kind of analyze things. Kids help you to just kind of get the core facts and then go with your gut. So kids are very good for work. The other thing I would say is, yes, there are trade-offs. I think we should not kid ourselves. I don't know any CEOs who work 30 hours a week. And every compromise has a price tag. But I think the most important thing is that you have to make those compromises with an act of choice and not by default. 
So you got to decide what's really important to you, what you want to double down on, and also what you can forego. Um, and look at both of the sides of risk, the risk of doing something and the risk of avoiding doing something. And just be really um, mindful and intentional in those choices because I really think the biggest danger is to be a spectator of your own life. Choices is what makes it meaningful, independent of our circumstances. The next observation is that although things are changing, my observation would be that the reward systems and the rungs of career ladders of most workplaces remain misaligned with the reality of women's lives. And I say that because in most workplaces, that sort of 10 year period around your 30s, when many women start and raise young families, is still the period when there's huge pressure in the workplace to meet certain key milestones to make progress. I was lucky because I stepped out of that during my, for my consulting period and I was able to grow and, and in a way catch up uh, when that phase was over. But this is the period when women in academics need to build their tenure files. It is the period when management consultants need to do to get international experience. It is the period when lawyers and other professional service uh, professionals have to you know, put in the billable hours to make partner. And when people in business need to get P&L and uh, other operational experience. It's just the way the workplace is structured. And women have a lot of stuff on their minds in those 10 years. And the draining demands, physical and emotional draining demands of a young family um, is hugely challenging. It's just a reality. And mo most workplaces just haven't really adequately figured out how to adjust to this pretty simple reality. And frankly, I think we're at the point where there's no excuse. If we could put a man on the moon, surely we can recognize that women have babies at a certain period in their lives. But as a result of this mismatch, I have noticed that in the context of our topic of leadership, women often emerge as leaders later in their careers. And almost at a different pace from men. So because as their children grow up, there's this enormous release of time and emotional energy that they can then use to really double down on their work and on their community engagement. And they will often choose totally new directions, um, you know, immerse themselves in something they really care about. I see women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s doing extraordinary things, taking on whole new careers, and they're less buffeted by the pressures on younger women. And they can bring you know, who they are to, to those leadership roles. And I think as a society, we need to figure out how we're going to take advantage of this capacity. Um, because it will be our loss if we don't. Now, maybe an aging workforce will make room for that. But you know, I'm not so sure. I mean, older women are not particularly valued in our culture. Number eight. The best opportunities in my life always came completely out of left field. And stepping out of a traditional career was on the one hand sort of frightening and on the other hand liberating. Because perhaps if I was in a very structured chosen career, I wouldn't have seen those opportunities and focused on the next step in a more structured path. Number nine, my women friends are incredibly important to me. And I learned this from watching my mother and the relationships that have sustained her um, to this day, and she just turned 87. And on this front, I've been absolutely blessed. Every step of the way I have worked with, uh, became friends with, crossed paths with just extraordinary women. You know, they've made great discoveries, they've built great businesses, they changed communities, they challenged authority, they made the world a better place. And we shared great joys and heartbreaking tragedies. And they've been strong, they've been kind, they've been funny, they've been extraordinarily generous. And they all juggle a million things. So my one piece of advice to younger women is make absolutely sure 
you keep space in your life for those female relationships. And finally, your choice of a life partner is a very important career decision. For several reasons, including the mundane stuff of life of who will take out the garbage. But to paraphrase Nietzsche, a good marriage, or whatever other form of partnering you choose, is like a long conversation. And that conversation will inspire you, sustain you, bore you, or diminish you. It's not an easy journey we're on, so pick carefully. Roles are in transition. So yes, my journey is unique, but it's only unique in the way that every other woman's journey is unique, and it contains all those elements of stress and pain and happiness and joy um, that is part of the almost mystical journey of women across the planet. And it's just one path, you know, and there are so many different paths, not a right one, not a wrong one, just many different ones, and it's our, it's our shared capacity, I think, that, that we bring to the world. So let me put a Mars hat on for a moment and just talk a little bit about women in innovation and entrepreneurship. And this is an important topic because of this extraordinary transition point, um, and one that I certainly believe will greatly impact Canada's future. Because the next 40 or 50 years, I think, will be the most fascinating, challenging, and pivotal period in human history. We see now emerging economies becoming knowledge economies. We've got more information at our fingertips than probably any of us ever thought we would have to digest in a lifetime. The global geopolitical order is certainly undergoing a transformation. Science and technology is just moving faster and faster, so creating new opportunities and also putting some spanners in the works. And as Canadians, we are choosing right now what kind of future we want for ourselves and for our kids against this backdrop of transformation. And the quality of that future will depend on our ability to innovate. And to innovate at a pace and in a manner that is relevant globally. Because it's not just what we do, it's also what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is doing more. So just like on a personal level, we make choices that determine our future, uh, we are making choices about the kind of Canada we want. And we can actively choose that future, or we can just kind of cruise and hope for the best. Now, women matter in this context for two very specific reasons. The first is sort of a math reason. Um, you know, innovation is powered by people. And by most measures, women are modest contributors to what we think of as the innovation economy. That's true in most regions of the world, and frankly, it's true here in Canada. And we all know Canada has exceptional talent, but our problem is we have very few knowledge workers in a global context, and the ones we have are spread out over this vast geography. And we certainly cannot compete in the world with only half our team on the field. So it is, it is a, a gender issue, yes, but it's also a critical economic issue. It's also true that women everywhere are getting more educated, are gaining influence in business, in government, in sort of third sector uh, organizations. And there's no question that there's extraordinary talent pool that's going to be unleashed into the global innovation economy as women step into leadership roles um, globally. South Africa is a good, uh, good example. I mean, when I lived there, it was a complete patriarchal society. I don't think we had one female MP. Today, we have quite a few more than us. So the question for us is, you know, what's Canada's plan on this topic? How are we going to get more women into these high growth uh, businesses that will create the jobs of the future? The second reason why, why women matter is perhaps even more important. And that is that innovation is humanity's toolbox. And in fact, it's our only toolbox to deal with the wicked problems. Um, the kind of problems that none of us can solve on our own. And we've got a few of those on our plate. And I think the hard work of innovation 
will be done in the next decades uh, when we as global citizens kind of put those big hairy problems on the table, climate change, global health, future of capitalism, aging society, and say, how are we going to solve this? How are we going to come together and create a new, a new path? And these challenges will, of course, affect all of us, but they'll affect our children more. And it's not just what we choose to do about them today. It's also about what we choose not to do about them today, because it's hard. And of course, we won't see the result of those choices right away, but they'll certainly haunt us in the future. Because we learned two things in the last few years of, of global economic crisis. The world's much more interconnected than we ever imagined. And secondly, our institutions are struggling to give us the leadership that we need in this new reality. And much as we may wish otherwise, these tough challenges are not going to be solved by the brilliant scientist or the visionary social entrepreneur or the charismatic politician or the billionaire. Even if we replace all those male heroes with female heroes, it's not going to happen. There's no shortcut. There's no magic bullet. The developing of solutions for these big multidimensional problems will involve us taking the big steps, doing the hard work to build new coalitions of problem solvers, solvers, taking the best of our science, the best of our business, the best of government, the best of our communities from across this country and around the world and basically aligning around a shared vision and working together. So it's a new approach to problem solving because business as usual is not going to get us there and using just the same players will not get us a different result. And women absolutely have to be part of this conversation. It's too important for them not to. And the data is pretty clear. When you have women around those tables, you get a different answer. And so from our, my perspective, the obligation is on us as women to figure out how we can really shape the conversations, how we can bring new collaboration skills, how we can bring new capabilities uh, new approaches to consensus building to those tables. How can we bring our best game and make a real difference? Which, of course, is at the core of the topic this evening, which is leadership. Because in the final analysis, the answers to these complex multidimensional challenges desperately need a new approach to leadership. Because if business as usual is not working, leadership as usual certainly isn't. So we need a leadership that's not just about what's in it for me, it's also about what's in it for us and for our kids and for our communities and for our planet. And it's a tricky kind of leadership because you've got to balance you know, information with understanding, um, expertise with context, um, talking with listening, confidence with vulnerability, um, you know, prosperity with resilience, politics and citizenship. Uh, power and influence, urgent and important that today was not in my lifetime. The essence of this challenge is recognizing that innovating around these complex problems is about admitting that we don't have the answer and that we have to work together uh, to find that answer. And it's not going to look like anything, any of our preconceived notions. But these are extraordinary times and I think we should not kid ourselves. We need extraordinary leadership. And we can't do it alone. So it is not just about what we can do inside Canada, it's also how we work in the world. Now if Canadians is gonna, are gonna bring something unique uh, to these challenges globally, I think uh, Canada's women have to play a part in making that contribution. So, so the question for us is how do we influence that process? Um, and I think the first step is to actually just take stock of the levers that are already available to us, you know, as half the population, as voters, as consumers, as social media users, as mothers. I, my observation would be we've been pretty passive about using those levers. Um, but we have to be thoughtful about how we do because we certainly have to move them we want new outcomes in a new way and in a new direction to create and unleash new energies uh, to create something better. 
Now we all assemble, and certainly in my case, you know, cobbled together um, this sort of life of, of what appears to be you know, meaning or how we define it by, by choosing things that matter to us and then choosing how we spend our time on those things that matter to us. And hopefully those things will also matter to our communities and, and to our future. But our contribution, and I think this is, this is the acknowledgement, is not, is not about heroics. It's about the small two choices we make around those lives of meaning. Um, and then how the unintended and intended consequences reverberate back to us. I certainly don't believe in personalized heroic leadership. I really think it's one small step at a time. It's a kind of a soft power, but it's pretty hard to earn. And we all have it. And the world needs it. So the question is just, how we use it is up to us. I'm quite far along in you know, writing this, this little book, thin volume of my life, um, and assembling its slightly disjointed chapters. And it's, it's my story, but of course it's also the story of those people who've traveled with me. Um, those I know and others who've just shared time and space. And my little book is just one of many that's being written. But I think the, the important thing is it's the collection of our stories that will ultimately set context and influence the stories that younger women will write. And you've got to just step back and say, you know what, women are writing half the stories. That's half of the human library. And the quality of that library is going to depend on our stories. So it's up to us. And I am enormously grateful, enormously grateful for the stories my grandmother and my mother wrote because it made it easier for me to write mine. And I have to tell you, when you invited me tonight, I really had to stop and think, am I doing enough to make it easier? For, the, for my own daughters and, frankly, the terrific young women that are just in those early chapters of their stories. So, thank you for making me pause and think about that. And thank you for having me. It went through the same implosion post the tech boom in early 2000, and unlike the U.S. Um, industry, never really recovered in terms of uh, new capital raise. So there's been a lot of attrition of funds, so fewer funds. Um, but from a female perspective, the biggest challenge we have in Canada is that we have almost a complete absence of um, female partners in venture capital funds. And it's the way the funds have evolved, and it's a small community, so, you know, it's sort of classic stuff of people hiring people who are like them. The data out of the U.S. is pretty clear that when you have a decision-making female partner in a venture capital fund, that fund invests in more women-led businesses. So, you know, there's no mystery there. Um, and it is a bet on people, right? So you can see how it plays out if, um, um, investing in somebody who, who you know may present differently or may may position their business differently. So part of it is just a structural problem, um, and I think what we see is Canadian women start businesses at a pretty good per capita rate, uh, but they tend to not be high growth businesses because for a high growth business you almost always have to raise significant outside finance. And so women start businesses that tend to be more service-oriented businesses, you know, where they can grow the businesses more organically because of this barrier. Um, so that's the reality. You add then on top of that the fact that it's more difficult in Canada to raise capital because our venture industry is smaller and far um, less risk-taking. So it's particularly early stage businesses have a very hard time, and some of that is because it evolved out of the banking industry and not so much out of the entrepreneurial industry. Uh, but I would say a fundamental problem is just, you know, lack of women partners, um, which is different. Of course, we see lots of senior women in the financial services industry. So it's a slice of financial services 
that women have been absolutely unable to penetrate. I can count, I think on one hand, the female partners across this country that are doing every stage second last year. That certainly is not it's not an easy an easy problem, but there are some you know I think some core features um, of of our challenge. Um, the first one I think is a very simple one. We do a lot of the right things. We do a lot of things right, and I think that's partly why you know we're all sort of frustrated with this innovation conversation, particularly when it leads over into productivity and you know this notion that we've got to be more productive. What what does that mean? We all work hard. I know that. Um, but the challenge is, it's not just what we do, it's what all the other countries are doing. And it is, you know, if you look globally, the investment and focus on building knowledge economy capacity, doubling down on post-secondary education institutions, um, building early stage venture capital funds that can close the capital gaps, all of that stuff is happening all over the world. So, Technology is leveling the playing field, so innovation can now come from everywhere. It used to be quite, you know, specialized as as countries like Brazil and China and others are becoming innovation economies. So, so there's a lot more competition, um, and then we also have a few structural problems. I mean, we have a small local market, so for young companies, what we see certainly is, you know, they have to be international companies almost from the day they're born. They have to go find that first customer and that market-making customer somewhere else. But they always receive one-third of the venture capital their competitor south of the border would receive. So it's a tough challenge to make that landing. And so a lot of companies, their growth will get truncated. So that's at the early stage stuff. So we start companies at about the right per capita rate, but our companies tend to not grow big enough. Um, because of that sort of uh, phenomenon. On the other hand, you know, the, the and study after study have said this, is that our mature businesses um, are not investing enough or, you know, focused enough on R&D investments, uh, equipment and machinery, you know, talent and all of those issues. We, we lag in business investment in R&D um, and have for, for some time. And you know, many people would attribute this sort of multi-factor productivity gap that's growing um, based on, on that particular factor. The flip side of that is if you look over that same period, Canadian businesses have been more profitable than their U.S. counterparts. So, you know, if necessity is the mother of invention, maybe we just have it too good. And in a period when a lot of other businesses had to uh, rethink their position because they were in a tough spot. We came through this recession, you know, pretty well. Um, so, you know, sometimes I think complacency is actually our biggest issue. It's, it's, you know, we're doing okay. And the rest of the world is, you know, chewing at our heels. Um, and there is no magic bullet. You know, I think that is the other lesson. You have to do all these things. You need a good education system. You need a healthy startup ecosystem. You need businesses to be good receptors for your innovation. You need to think globally. Um, and all of those pieces need to work uh, for us to gain, gain an effort over time. Um, and we got to make it a total priority. Um, I, I was on a you know shocking telephone call two days ago um, with the Minister of the Economy from the UAE, and you know the statements they are making, the steps they are taking. This is a country that's obviously swimming in money, um, but the steps they are taking to transition themselves to a knowledge economy is like a total clear plan. I think it's sometimes hard for us. Let's get on this plan. What's our innovation? What's our moonshot? Um, we hate making choices. So we'd rather just be a kind of a 10%, you know, version of the United States. Kind of do what the U.S. is doing, sort of diet version of the United States. Um, but we're not big enough, so we have to make choices and choose the areas where we can really differentiate. And those, that's, those are hard things for us to, to, to do, and it's, you know, also understandable given this big floppy geography.
Um, you know, that's a hugely tricky question, right? I think, so let me, let me put my optimistic spin on it, because I'm, I'm just an eternal optimist. I think we are in an era, particularly post this last global recession and the mess that it created, you know, in so many people's lives, um, that there is, there is a new kind of reevaluation of what business is and what business is role in society. And of course, you know, it's a, it's a first world conversation on some levels. Um, but I think we are starting to see some extraordinary leadership by some global companies. You know, Nike is a really good example who went into a massively competitive space of, you know, athletic wear manufacturing in China and partnered with all their key competitors to re-engineer from an environmental perspective the supply chain for that stuff in China. It was, it was an extraordinary act of leadership. Um, you know, Paul Pullman of Unilever um, has stepped up and basically said, I'm no longer doing quarterly reporting to my shareholders because it forces short-term termism. And I'm going to make social and environmental values core in our product strategy. Well, you know, Profits are going like this, and the smartest young people in the world are flooding in the universe talent department. So, so I think that balance of you know opportunistic trade, necessary trade, and trade by moral choice, if that's the spectrum, I'm hoping that you know moral trade will become good business increasingly. And I think that's what we should demand of the businesses in our communities as well. But, you know, navigating the global realities is a huge challenge for, for business and for government leaders. So I, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get to any form of purity ever. But we can't demand more of our, of our businesses and our governments in terms of human rights. So I totally faked it. You know, it's only in retrospect that you look at the forks in the road and pretend that you did a big rational analysis and, and risk analysis. I, I can't pretend otherwise. It's fascinating, though, to think how different life could have been if you chose another route. So there must be some subconscious process that we all go through that actually weighs those risks, um, maybe in a way that's much more sophisticated than our rational selves. That's what I like to believe. Um, but I, I can't honestly say that, you know, um, I'm now more, more sort of intentional in terms of thinking, thinking about the trade-offs um, than I certainly was in, in my younger days. But I, I do think that um, the importance for me is that I really am quite obsessed about this issue of the crack cocaine of immediacy in our lives. I really think we are at an almost catastrophic level of lack of reflection. Um, you know, personally, in our public discourse, um, and so I, you know, I, I guess I'm talking to myself when I say that I, you know, we got to pause more and we got to think about it. Are women in Canada more risk averse? I mean, we, I get this question all the time about. Canadians are more risk averse, and that's why we don't have as many billion dollar companies that entrepreneurs don't, you know, think big enough. I live in a bubble, maybe, but I don't see it. I mean, I see this country was built on risk. You know, we, you know, you guys in the mining business are, are in the risk business every day. I don't see Canadians as that risk averse. We don't, you know, we don't party about failure in the same way. Um, but I'm not so sure we're that risk averse. I have almost the opposite theory in prison. I think we're more afraid of success. I think we're really, and that's what, you know, we avoid the choices, right? We, it's harder for us to back winners, right? Um, people were kind of waiting for Blackberry to stumble. I mean, these guys were just, you know, getting too big for their bridges. So I wonder if that's not more of our challenge. Um, than the, the lack of risk taking. Because I don't, I don't see it. I, but, but I do work with entrepreneurs all the time, so I, I probably have a pretty biased sample. Um, but I think women, you know, if you 
take it right down to the personal, how to get kid is a massive risk. I think women take on huge risks by just having kids. And maybe that fills our risk bucket for a while. And you know, you gotta kind of just keep things going. Um, but as I say then, you know, they, I see women emerge and do amazing things when, when that uh, pressure is off um, later in life. So maybe there's a, there's a you know, movement that we should start with you know, women that, whose kids go off and uh, start a whole new political movement or something. Maybe there's a party there we can start. <laughs>
So we have to create environments, including funding environments, I think, where women feel, you know, welcome, included, as full participants. And, and that's, those are, so it's the subtle levers, I think, that, that ultimately sort of drive the change. And then, of course, we have to have the funding goals at the back end, whether they're formally structured or informal. So I'm optimistic about crowdfunding. There's lots of issues with crowdfunding. Um, but I think it's an envelope we've got to push just because it does create more access channels. Well, you know, just starting with the question of infrastructure, you know, I think we all recognize the massive infrastructure deficit that um, that has been building, and you know, a lot of a lot of people would say this is the time to invest in infrastructure because the cost of capital is so low, and in fact, it's um, it's so fundamental to the future. I mean, you certainly look at a city like Toronto and the productivity loss because of you know dysfunctioning infrastructure is it's massive. Um, we will have to go about those problems differently, just like we did when we built the railway. I mean, our big um, geography and our temperatures and all of those challenges, you know, mean that we have to think about not just um, building old-style infrastructure in this large country. We have to actually become innovators on what's the next generation of infrastructure. I think that's the only way. Um, but it takes political will to make those big decisions, and you know, one of the challenges I think we have is our short-termism, both in business and in government. You know, our politicians give them some, cut them some slack. They don't get rewarded for making long-term decisions. So, um, so it's very, very difficult for us to do that. But you know, that problem will, will come at us. But what if we became the world leader in cold temperature? What if mean, we really figure out how to deliver medicine and education in remote communities? And, um, there's lots of opportunities for us to also uh, transpose our, our geography into, um, into new, new innovation opportunities. And, um, you know, and at the same time, I mean, we're blessed with this unbelievable land. Um, we're, we have a guy who works with us who recently recruited from the Netherlands. Now, if you look at a map, the Netherlands is a pretty puny country. They export more food than we do. How is that even possible? Um, because they do the value added stuff, right? So, so there's just things that we need to just get the to grips with. And it, they have to be inclusive, inclusive solutions. Um, and I was impressed, you know, a lot of us in Saskatoon a couple of weeks ago, where obviously the urban native population is, is exploding. And I was very impressed with the, the, the efforts that people are really making to finally come to work with that you know, big shame of, of Canadian life. Um, but your, your challenges are, are, that you put are, are at the heart of, you know, what kind of future do we want? And how do we come up with solutions that are really relevant to our local communities? Because, you know, it is a constellation of lights, right? Across a geography like this, you need vibrant local communities. And then we got to figure out how do we work in a networked way so that we can present to the world some kind of critical mass. Because we all see it repeatedly. You see it in Sudbury. We're too small to show up on the list. When people come to Canada and they look at what's in our universities, what's in our workplaces, they're amazed. It happens every time. But we're not, unless we actually come together and tell our story collectively and share our capacity, I think that's how we can actually innovate in a way that's highly relevant globally. Because if we can do that for Canadians, workplaces of the world are going to be much more connected. And you know we have the whole world here as part of our population, so there's big opportunities for us. Um, and our land masses is a challenge, but oh my God, what what an unbelievable blessing! But let's not let's not rest on our laurels just because we've got it. Right? That's the challenge. I think.